next meeting. Today, committee members voted not to grant immunity to four witnesses and discussed the scope of the investigation. The meeting, led by committee chairman Dan Burton, is about two hours. The committee will come to order. Good morning, everybody. A quorum being present, the Committee on Government Reform and Oversight will come to order. The committee is assembled today to consider two different matters. First, the release of one deposition, and second, the granting of congressional immunity to four witnesses in the committee's investigation. First, I wanted to take a moment to welcome a new member to the committee. We are joined today by a new Republican member, Ron Lewis, from the 2nd District of Kentucky. Mr. Lewis al already serves on the National Security and Agricultural Committees, and I want to welcome uh, Ron uh, with it, to be with us today. It's good having you, Ron. I ask unanimous consent that all members' written statements be included in the record, and without objection, so ordered. I now recognize myself for such time as I may consume to make an opening statement. Today, we are meeting for a second time to vote on immunity for four witnesses. The Justice Department has been thoroughly consulted, and the Justice Department has signed off on all four of these individuals. We are not going to have a pretty debate today. I'm going to be the subject of some personal attacks. But that's okay. It comes with the territory, and I've gotten used to it. Before we begin this debate, I want to remind everyone what brought us here in the first place. We began this investigation because of some very serious allegations that arose out of the 1996 presidential elections. That the DNC accepted millions of dollars in illegal foreign campaign contributions that $3 million of the $4.5 million in contributions attributed to John Wong had to be returned because of suspicions about their origins, that the Chinese government had developed and implemented a plan to funnel money into the United States to influence our elections, that Charlie Tree, a friend of the president's from Arkansas, had funneled close to $700,000 in contributions associated with a Taiwanese cult to the President's Legal Defense Fund, that Charlie Tree was behind roughly $600,000 in suspicious contributions to the Democrat National Committee, that Pauline Kanchanilak and her family funneled half a million dollars to the Democrat Party from Thailand, that Chinese gun merchants, Cuban drug smugglers, and Russian mob figures were being invited to intimate White House events with the President in exchange for large contributions that the decision to lease the Long Beach Naval Shipyard to a Chinese government-owned shipping company may have been tied to campaign contributions, that the decision to establish the Utah Desert National Monument and take out of commission major deposits of clean burning coal may have provided economic benefits to the Riyadi family in the Lippo Group in Indonesia, that the former Associate Attorney General received $700,000 from friends and associates of the President's including $100,000 from the Riyadi family at a time that he was supposed to be cooperating with a criminal investigation. More recently, allegations have surfaced that a criminal investigation into the transfer of missile technology to China may have been jeopardized by Clinton administration decisions on behalf of L'Oreal Corporation. The CEO of L'Oreal, Bernard Schwartz, was reported to be the single largest individual contributor to the DNC in 1996. These are all very serious allegations. They deserve to be thoroughly debated. The public certainly has a right to know what's happened. Unfortunately, we are probably not going to spend much time debating these issues today. This is not what my friends on the other side of the aisle want to talk about. Instead, they want to debate procedural issues. I guess if all these allegations were swirling around a Republican president, I'd want to debate procedural issues too.
but that is not what the American people sent us here to do. We're going to have a very heated debate about the Webster-Hubble tapes. Some of my colleagues are outraged that we have violated Mr. Hubble's privacy by releasing these tapes. We didn't see quite as much outrage on that side of the room about invasion of privacy when the Clinton White House was reviewing hundreds of FBI files of Republicans, but times change. Well, I'm outraged too. Let me tell you what I'm outraged about. I'm outraged that it was necessary to subpoena these tapes in the first place. It should not have been necessary. I'm outraged that we have a former Associate Attorney General of the United States taking the Fifth Amendment with this committee. Mr. Hubble was handpicked by the President to serve as one of our nation's top law enforcement officials. This is a position of trust. I'm outraged that Mr. Hubble isn't prepared to appear before this committee and explain why he received $700,000 from associates of the President and what he did for that money. I'm outraged that Mr. Hubble won't explain what his relationship was with the Riotti family and why they gave him $100,000. I'm outraged that the President won't give the American people a straight answer about whether he asked the Riottis to pay Mr. Hubble, and if he did, why. I think this is the bare minimum that the American people can expect from the President and a senior Justice Department official. If Mr. Hubble refuses to talk to us, then we have no option but to look for other sources of information because the American people have a right to know the truth. There is absolutely no question that these tapes belong in the public record. The American people have a right to know what Mr. Hubble meant when he said he had to, quote, roll over one more time. The American people have a right to know why Mrs. Hubble felt like she was being squeezed by the White House. These aren't trivial questions. This is serious business. You don't have to take my word for it. Listen to what the Washington Post says. The people at the Post have never been great admirers of mine, but here's what their editorial page had to say last week. Quote, the accurate transcripts are also damning or very nearly so. They make clear that Mr. Hubble and his wife had a sense of themselves as being held on kind of a string by the White House to which they were beholden for badly needed income. The tapes appeared to raise questions both about Mr. Hubble's conduct and about the White House's behavior toward the former Associate Attorney General while he was in prison." End quote. So let's dispense with all this talk about Mr. Hubble's privacy. These tapes raise very troubling questions and the American people should not be kept in the dark. Now let's talk a little bit about the editing. My staff spent three weeks editing 150 hours of conversations down to one hour so that the personal conversations that had no bearing on the investigation would not be released. Everybody knows that mistakes were made in the editing process. A few paragraphs were cut out that should have been left in. It was not intentional. It was not malicious. It was a mistake plain and simple. And I'll tell you something very honestly. When you have a dedicated staff like I do, working late into the night and on weekends to try to overcome the stonewalling and the obstruction we face, mistakes will happen from time to time. We're all human beings. But I am the chairman, and I do take responsibility. I do want to make a few things clear for the record. First, the tapes were never doctored. This was a malicious and false charge being circulated by Democrat operatives. Second, the committee never produced word-for-word -word transcripts. The committee produced logs that contained summaries of sections of the tapes that are relevant to the investigation. Reporters were allowed to come in and listen to those relevant sections of the tapes in their entirety. The two passages that Mr. Waxman has been so upset about were in those sections of the tapes. So you cannot possibly argue that there was any attempt to hide the ball on anyone. Third, exculpatory statements about the Clintons and others were not systematically edited out, as some have charged. In fact, the logs produced by the committee contained clearly exculpatory statements by Mr. Hubble about Hillary Clinton and Marcia Scott. They were not only in the logs, they were underlined. They were underlined. So all of this talk about selective editing just is not true. What I find most unfortunate is that these couple of mistakes that were made have given defenders of the president a chance to change the subject, as they've done many times in the past. 
The defenders of the president don't want to find out if the $700,000 Webster Hubble received was hush money. The defenders of the president don't want to ask what Webster Hubble meant when he said, I guess I'll have to roll over one more time. I think that Roll Call said it best in their editorial on Monday. Quote, after Burton produced prison tapes of Clinton friend Webster Hubble discussing how he might have to roll over one more time and his wife talking about being squeezed by the White House, apparently to maintain her husband's silence, not one Democrat took the Howard Baker stance that a crime might have been committed and that the matter deserved investigation. Not one. Roll Call went on to say, not a single congressional Democrat has raised a question about Clinton's use of executive privilege to thwart independent counsel prosecutor, independent prosecutor Ken Starr's investigation. Not one. Two months ago, we released information showing that Charlie Tree's foreign benefactor, Ning Lap Singh, brought $330,000 in cash into the country over a period of two years. I would like to have this chart shown on the TV screens. Each time he entered the country, he was almost immediately taken to either the White House or to a DNC fundraiser. In 1994, Ning Lap Singh brought $175,000 in cash into the country. $175,000. Two days later, he was in the White House meeting with Charlie Tree and Mark Middleton. My Democrat colleagues did not bat an eye. Not a single expression of concern about what was going on. Last month, as we began holding hearings about foreign money in southern Florida, we learned that a prominent Democrat fundraiser had urged a wealthy German national to make conduit contributions to Democratic campaigns. We learned that the Federal Election Committee did not follow up on this evidence and that this individual has gone unpunished to this day. Again, not a single expression of outrage from the other side of the aisle. I think Roll Call summed it up best when they said, quote, present day Democrats have been working hard to make sure that Congress and the public know as little as possible about what President Clinton has done, end quote. Those aren't my words, and there was no selective editing. Today, some of my colleagues are going to accuse me of abusing my powers. If you want to have a debate about abuse of power, that is a debate I would welcome. Let's discuss whether it's an abuse of power for the president to misuse executive privilege to keep witnesses from testifying in criminal investigations. Let's discuss whether it's an abuse of power to withhold White House videotapes from Congress for six months despite a subpoena that clearly called for the videotapes. Let's discuss whether it's an abuse of power to manipulate the FBI and the Justice Department to prosecute the head of the White House Travel Office who was found innocent in a, in a heartbeat. Let's discuss whether it's an abuse of power for the Clinton White House to order up 900 confidential FBI files on Republicans from the Bush administration. There's no abuse of power here. I have the same subpoena power that Lee Hamilton had in the Iran-Contra and October surprise investigations. The very same power. The difference is that in those investigations, he did not have to issue many subpoenas. He dealt with a White House that cooperated instead of obstructed. He had a cooperative minority. He did not have more than 90 witnesses taking the Fifth Amendment or fleeing the country. Those are important facts that everyone should keep in mind. Now let's turn to the business at hand. Today we are going to vote on immunity for four witnesses. These four individuals have exercised their Fifth Amendment rights and they will not testify without immunity. The Justice Department has been consulted at length. The Justice Department does not oppose immunity in any of these cases. In fact, the Justice Department has already immunized two of these people. I would like to focus my remarks on one of these individuals, Kent Law. As everyone knows by now, Kent Law is a business associate of Ted Siong. He is the U.S. distributor for Red Pagoda Mountain Cigarettes. Ted Siong has a major financial stake in these cigarettes, which are manufactured by a Chinese government-owned company. It is very likely that the $400,000 that Ted Siong and Kent Law contributed to the DNC came from the proceeds of selling Red Pagoda Mountain cigarettes all over the world. Remember, this company is owned by the communist Chinese government. 
if this company was being used as a vehicle for the Chinese government to funnel money into the United States and the campaigns, then Kent Law is probably the person who would know. The only way to find out is to give Kent Law immunity and to hear his testimony. I find it very ironic that some of my colleagues who are such staunch opponents of the tobacco industry voted to block immunity for Kent Law and keep the facts in this case secret. I want to make a final appeal to my colleagues to put partisanship aside and vote to allow these witnesses to testify. Ted Siong and his family gave to both parties, both parties, Republican and Democrat. This is not a partisan matter. I understand that by voting to block immunity, you feel like you are punishing me. But in reality, you are not punishing me. You are punishing the American people. The American people have a right to know if foreign tobacco money corrupted their political system. They have a right to know. I hope that everyone has thought very carefully about your vote. We have good men and women on both sides of this committee. I urge you all to vote for immunity and to let the facts come out for the American people. And with that, I yield to my colleague, Mr. Oh, just one second. I now uh, recognize Mr. Waxman for the purpose of offering an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, this morning I will again attempt to explain why the Democratic minority is deeply frustrated with this investigation and why we believe fundamental changes must be made. Our view is that the chairman is too partisan, has been given too much power, and has abused his authority. He alone controls this investigation, not the committee, and he is accountable to no one. That's why every member on our side voted against immunity three weeks ago, and that's why we're prepared to vote against it today. It has nothing to do with liking or disliking the chairman. It has everything to do with accountability. No investigation in the last 40 years has operated like this one. In every major investigation, whether it be the House Watergate investigation, Iran-Contra, the October surprise, and even Senator Thompson's investigation in the Senate on campaign finance, the practice was for subpoenas to be issued and information released only with the concurrence of the minority or if the question were put to a vote of the full committee. That's a matter of public record, not opinion and those rules enhanced the prospects of bipartisanship. Those rules gave the minority a voice, not a veto, but created a cooperative environment that allowed a Howard Baker to emerge and a consensus to be reached. With those rules in place, all subpoenas were subjected to scrutiny, and they needed to be explained. None were ever issued unilaterally or by staff whim. In contrast, Chairman Burton has issued over 500 subpoenas unilaterally, and he's never had to explain anything about those subpoenas to us or the Republicans, why they were needed. He just simply could sign his name if a staff person ran up to him and said, hey, there's another guy we could subpoena. Let's bring him in for a deposition. We can make him answer questions under oath. And if we ask him something personal and he doesn't like it, there's not much he can do unless he wants to fight a contempt of Congress citation. And then we can release that personal information to the press. Dan Burton alone can do those things. Issuing a subpoena is an awesome power. It ought to concern Democrats and Republicans, liberals and conservatives alike, because it is the way that the power of the federal government can be brought to intrude in the lives of American citizens, and they can be compelled to produce their private personal records and answer questions no matter what those questions might be. There has never been an investigation where the chairman has asserted the kind of power that Chairman Burton has. And there's never been an investigation that's been so 
plagued by mistakes, raw partisanship, and wrong judgments. Chairman Burton blames the Democrats for this unfortunate mess, but that's not what the record says. Until three weeks ago, the Democrats on this committee did not prevent the chairman from issuing a single subpoena, taking a single deposition, or holding a single hearing. In fact, there was only one instance in 1997 when our votes did matter and where we could have blocked the chairman from acting. And notwithstanding our feelings that this investigation was be being conducted in a partisan and unfair manner, we supported him and we voted for immunity for witnesses that uh, chairman requested we grant immunity to in that uh, vote last October. We hoped that this gesture of bipartisanship might inspire the chairman to work with us, but it didn't. As soon as we voted for that immunity request, after our votes were counted on that very same day, the chairman and the Republican majority defeated our motion to release all deposition transcripts and then adopted a rule over our objections that made it more difficult for the committee members to participate in this investigation. So six months ago, on October 22, all the Democratic members wrote to the chairman and informed him we would oppose future immunity requests unless the rules were changed. And the chairman again refused to adopt the rules that Senator Thompson followed in his investigation. The chairman's insistence that he alone run this investigation has discredited the entire effort. It has become the Dan Burton investigation, not the investigation of the Government Reform and Oversight Committee, not the investigation of the Democrats and the Republicans who were elected by the voters. It's his investigation and his investigation along with his staff. They decide what to do. They've had all the power. Now, I think the release of the Hubble tapes was an absolute debacle. Chairman insists about these Hubble tapes that a lot of things were done that he now defines as proper. Well, I'm going to insert with my statement a, an article that outlines the whole way this Burton-Hubble uh, tape uh, transcript was handled. The fact of the matter is that transcripts of those conversations were released selectively to the press on Thursday and Friday, maybe not to all the press, but only to certain press, edited in a way that was most damaging to hurt Mr. Hubble, and it was done in order to get press stories that would best serve the political agenda of the chairman. These conversations that Mr. Hubble had from his prison were with his wife, his children, his personal friends. 99% of them should never be made public. They shouldn't even have been listened to by anybody outside of uh, authority to keep it confidential because they're really nobody else's business. The one percent that might be relevant to any investigation should have been kept as evidence to be looked at in the context of all the facts because you can't take excerpts of those conversations and reach any clear conclusion. There were parts of that conversation that were troubling. One wonders what Webb Hubble meant when he made certain statements to his wife. But Ken Starr is the prosecutor, and he has these tapes. The Justice Department can have these tapes. Our investigators can have these tapes, but they were never intended to be made public. And if Ken Starr had made them public, he would have been forced to resign as independent counsel and probably disbarred. 
If a reporter had made them public, he would have been fired. And only because of the rules of the Congress that exempt the Congress from the Privacy Act do we not have a prosecution of the chairman for making these uh, tapes public. But in releasing them, he acted contrary to the rules of this committee and the rules of the House, and I think any rules of basic decency to protect people's privacy. And the privacy was not just of Mr. Hubble, but his family and of all the people that were talked about in conversations he had with family members. The chairman's inappropriate comment about the president, absolutely inappropriate. He's the president, whether you like him or not, whether you respect him or not. You have to respect the office of the presidency. And to use a pejorative, derogatory term about the president was absolutely out of, out of, uh, out of line. And what was even more out of line was that the chairman of this committee would say that he's out to get the president. That admission that he was after the president brought ridicule to this committee. And the fact is that we've only held three days of investigative hearings on foreign money in the 1996 campaign despite the fact that the chairman has unlimited powers and unlimited budget, he could call hearings, he can issue, de uh, issue subpoenas. We've only had three legislative hearings, investigative hearings on the 1996 foreign campaign contributions. Only three. People have followed this investigation. We have a pattern. Every time we start a hearing, the chairman is full of rhetoric and outrage and allegations and accusations. But the facts aren't there on the record. We haven't had hearings where the facts are set before us to show whether these allegations are correct, whether they're justified. Allegations are made accusations are brought forward and then we move on to something else. <clears throat> this is not just the assessment of the Democrats here. In last week's newspapers around the country, we've had editorials about the chairman's investigation. And here's just a sample of their headlines. The New York Times, the Dan Burton problem, Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, Rep. Dan Burton brings a serious inquiry into disrespute. Seattle Post Intelligencer, remove Burton from money probe. The Chicago Tribune, give Dan Burton the gate. San Antonio Express News, Burton bumbles in bad faith. Fayetteville Observer Times, Chairman, Chairman's rampage demeans entire house and the Hill a chairman out of control. Republicans are saying the same thing. Just read today's Washington Post and The Hill. They quote Republican staff on the committee as saying that they are, quote, ashamed to be part of something so unprofessional. And that, quote, 90% of the staff doesn't have a clue as to how to conduct an investigation, end quote. What we have is an investigation out of control and without credibility. Voting for immunity today without adopting any changes in the rules on how this committee operates would just worsen the problem. It doesn't have to be that way. I know this investigation is genuinely important to the chairman, to members on both sides of the aisle. Before voting on immunity, Let's take a moment to at least try to get this investigation back on track. I ask my co Republican colleagues to consider one last time what we are going to be proposing. I'm prepared to recommend to my Democratic colleagues to vote for this immunity request, but two steps have to be taken. 
The practices guiding this investigation must be modified to reflect, reflect the ones that Senator Thompson used and every other investigative committee has used. The Republicans on this committee, on a party line vote, delegated all this authority to the chairman. I ask you, take it back. Take the powers back and give it to the members. You're in the majority. If you disagree with us, you can still outvote us. But let us have opportunities, if we think actions are being taken that are inappropriate, to make our case to you. And then if you don't think we have a good case, vote against us. But don't vote to give the chairman the power to make the decision. We can argue to the chairman that we think a subpoena is inappropriate, and he could say, no, it's not his investigation. It's our investigation. Bring the power back to the committee members. And secondly, another senior Republican member of this committee should be appointed to head this investigation. I have an amendment that I'd like to offer to our rules, which does nothing more than apply to our investigation, what I've said Senator Thompson's committee did and all the other committees have done in the past. Under these rules, he was able to hold 20 more hearings than our committee has had, and he's uncovered far more significant information than we've had as a result of our $6 million having been spent on this investigation, which at this rate will make this the most expensive investigation in the history of the Congress. It's not too late. By taking these steps now, we can set a new course for the coming months of cooperation and responsible investigation and oversight. And if we don't, this investigation will wither and most of our jurisdiction will be transferred to another committee. Mr. Chairman, I ask that at least my amendment to the rules be considered before we proceed to the question of immunity. You can ignore that request. You can unilaterally dictate the agenda for today, but Mr. Chairman, I urge you that you don't do that. All I'm asking is that the rules that we adopted last year be put to another vote. Let the members decide if they want an investigation to continue without change. Let the members vote on the rules under which we're going to be conducting this investigation. Let us ask the members to be accountable for after all that has gone wrong with this investigation, to be accountable again for a vote whether they want to give you all the power, whether they want this investigation to continue as it has been conducted up to this date. We will ask you for that opportunity in hopes that the uh, proposal will be adopted so that we can bring this investigation back on track. The Democratic members stand ready to work with you and to keep the investigation in our committee and to consider your immunity requests on their merits. All that we ask is that you be willing to work with us. Mr. Chairman, that ends my opening statement. I'd like to now to be recognized for the purpose of offering an amendment to the committee procedures. The gentleman was recognized for an opening statement only, and the chair will not uh, recognize the gentleman for the purpose of the amendment he proposes. You have before you the agenda for the committee's business meeting for today, and you will see that the changes to the committee's rules and document protocol are not on the agenda. Those matters have been before this committee, I believe, three times previously uh, in three separate committee meetings last year. We will not revisit them today. If you want a committee meeting regarding the committee rules, you should follow the clear procedures in House Rule 11 to call such a meeting. So we will not consider your motion to today. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to insert in the record after the statement of uh, Mr. Waxman uh, two uh, documents. One is this source by the Congressional Resource Research Service uh, relating to congressional investigation budgets. Uh, he made statements that were uh, 
inaccurate as to the cost of this investigation. And also uh, a letter from the clerk of this uh, committee that states exactly how much has been spent to date uh, in uh, pursuit of this investigation, which is in direct conflict with a statement that the ranking member just made before the committee. Reserving the right to object. The gentleman will state his reservation. Mr. Chairman, I, I regret that you're not willing to let us offer our motion to have the members respond to the question of the rules of this committee, and I've already indicated that if you force us to vote on the immunity request, we will reject it. The gentleman uh, from Florida is asking to put something in the record that he thinks contradicts my comments. I have no objection to it going to the record. It ought to go in, however, when he debates the matter and not as an appendage to uh, my opening statement or as part of my opening statement. And uh, on that basis, I'm going to object, but I, don't, I will not object if he wants to have it in the record at some other point. But I do want to use this reservation on this unanimous con consent request to express my uh, regret that we're not going to be permitted to have the members take responsibility for the rules under which this committee is operating. Mr. Chairman, I w uh, I, uh, I like to object. speak. Objection is heard. You can put it in the record. It's yes, and I, I would like to uh, comply with the request of the ranking member that it be put in anywhere in the record he so choose, but the accurate information regarding the cost of this uh, investigation, which he described hmm. to this committee and the American public and the Congress, was uh, inaccurate, and I have the exact figures uh, for all the well, investigations the prepared by the Congressional Research Service and by the clerk of this committee. And we need to be dealing with facts and the well, truth, the point not... Of order, point of order, uh, not, Point of order, Mr. Chairman. And, and I'd be glad to have Chairman. it inserted wherever he likes. Thank the you. The gentleman's out of order. I would ask unanimous consent that the gentleman's documents, whatever he has, and our documents that show uh, the accuracy of our statements be placed in the record at some place, uh, side by side, or at least uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, in the same... Uh, paragraph or section so that uh, people can see this information and understand uh, what uh, the uh, congressional research does have to say. Without objection, all of these uh, articles uh, will be put in the record at the proper place. Uh, I ask unanimous consent that the deposition of Yusuf Capra be made publicly available and without objection, so ordered. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, reserving the right to object, uh, I would like to uh, request that the unanimous consent be uh, granted to make all the depositions a part of the public record. The public has a right to know, as you've said, not just private comments by a man in prison that should have been kept private, but all the depositions that have been taken uh, uh, in, in, uh, outside the public view by uh, the staff of this committee. So if the chairman would permit, I'd like to ask uh, him to agree that all the depositions uh, be made part of the public record. Does the gentleman from California object to the motion as read? There, was that a motion or a unanimous consent request? It was a unanimous consent request. Do you object to that unanimous consent request that the deposition of Yusuf Capra be made publicly available? The, the Justice Department wanted it, that's why. Well, I, I don't object to making that deposition public. What I'd like to request is that the unanimous consent request be expanded to make all the depositions that our committee has taken uh, public. We're not, uh, I'm not uh, going to amend my unanimous consent request. Does the gentleman object? I, I don't object, uh, and I, will, uh, I would like to be recognized to make my unanimous consent request, if the chair would permit. Well, without objection, the uh, deposition of Yusuf Capra is uh, publicly available as uh, requested. Mr. Chairman, may I uh, make unanimous consent request that all the depositions that have been taken by our committee be made public so that uh, it will be on the record? Uh, you can make that unanimous re uh, consent request uh, if you like. I'm making it. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, sure. reserve the right to object. Um, I would be concerned at, about unilaterally putting all of these depositions on the record now with, while the investigation is proceeding. In our particular subcommittee, we're investigating the White House computer database where there are allegations that perhaps the crime of theft of government property may have been committed by this White House. Now, 
before we do all the depositions and allow all of the people who are involved with this to speak for the record, I think it could be very damaging and misleading if some of the depositions were released while others still had to be taken. So I would have to object to this unanimous consent request on a unilateral basis across the board. These things need to be handled very carefully with respect to each part of the investigation that is underway. Will the gentleman yield, uh, objection to, is will the gentleman yield to me? But I, I'm happy to work with the ranking member and, and the ranking member of my subcommittee to, as we get complete that, in my part of the investigation, to make that information completely available for all the depositions will, will the gentleman at yield? the appropriate time. I, yes. I, I, uh, your investigation has gone on for three years, and it seems to me that the public ought to have that information. But out of respect to the points you're making, uh, let me uh, make a unanimous consent request that all the full committee investigative depositions be made public, and we will exclude those that relate to your subcommittee's investigation. I, I appreciate that, but I suspect the point would still apply uh, to the full committee that their investigation may be partway through in different aspects of Well, it. you know, Webb Hubble's investigation is still being conducted, and all those tapes were put out there on the public record. Objection Certainly is our heard. depositions ought to be out Objection there. Objection is heard. I have a motion at the desk and ask unanimous consent that... Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I now call up four immunity resolutions relating to Irene Wu, Nancy Lee, Larry Wong, and Kent La, and ask unanimous consent that they be considered in block and as, as read. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. La Tourette. Mr. Chairman, I move to close debate on the pending immunity resolutions and all amendments and motions relating thereto in 60 minutes, and that the time be equally divided between the majority and the minority, that all time yielded be used for the purposes of debate only, and I further move the previous question on the motion to Mr. limit Mr. Chairman, uh, Chairman, we have many members here who want to debate this issue, and I don't think they ought to be gagged and prevented from speaking. Uh, let's have uh, an opportunity for members to talk no more than five minutes under the rules. Would the gentleman yield? The question, the question is not debatable. Uh, there will be 30 minutes on each side, according to the re uh, according to the motion made by the gentleman. Uh, the question is on the motion. Mr. Chairman, to the question is on the motion to close debate on the resolutions offered in block. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed signify by saying no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes roll have it. Call. Roll call has been requested and will be ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burton? Aye. Mr. Burton votes aye. Mr. Gilman? Mr. Hastert? Mr. Hastert votes aye. Mrs. Morella? Mrs. Morella votes aye. Mr. Shays? Mr. Cox? Aye. Mr. Cox votes aye. Ms. Ross Layton? Aye. Ms. Ross Layton votes aye. Mr. McHugh? Mr. McHugh votes aye. Mr. Horn? Aye. Mr. Horn votes aye. Mr. Micah? Aye. Mr. Micah votes aye. Mr. Davis of Virginia? Aye. Mr. Davis of Virginia votes aye. Mr. McIntosh? Aye. Mr. McIntosh votes aye. Mr. Souter? Mr. Souter votes aye. Mr. Scarborough? Mr. Scarborough votes aye. Mr. Shattuck? Mr. Shattuck votes aye. Mr. La Tourette? Mr. La Tourette votes aye. Mr. Sanford? Aye. Mr. Sanford votes aye. Mr. Sununu? Aye. Mr. Sununu votes aye. Mr. Sessions? Aye. Mr. Sessions votes aye. Mr. Pappas? Aye. Mr. Pappas votes aye. Mr. Snowbarger? Aye. Mr. Snowbarger votes aye. Mr. Barr? Aye. Mr. Barr votes aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Mr. Miller votes aye. Mr. Lewis? Aye. Mr. Lewis votes aye. Mr. Waxman? Uh, we haven't been allowed to offer our amendments. Uh, we uh, are not allowed to have the depositions made public. Mr. Waxman? We're having Regular our order. debate order. Uh, limited. Order. The general will state his vote. The general will state his vote. This is an arbitrary procedure. Regular order. 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 And I don't see how you hope in any way to get bipartisanship if we're going to have such arbitrary Mr. Waxman, uh, would you order. vote? Ramming you down. How did you vote on the FBI files to be released? Regular that was 19-0 also. I uh, vote against this uh, gag. Gentleman votes no. Mr. Lantos? No. Mr. Lantos votes no. Mr. Wise? Mr. Owens? 
Mr. Towns? No. Mr. Towns votes no. Mr. Kanjorski? No. Mr. Kanjorski votes no. Mr. Condon? Mr. Condon votes no. Mr. Sanders? Mr. Sanders votes no. Mrs. Maloney? Mrs. Maloney votes no. Mr. Barrett? Mr. Barrett votes no. Ms. Norton? No. Ms. Norton votes no. Mr. Fatah? No. Mr. Fatah votes no. Mr. Cummings? No. Mr. Cummings votes no. Mr. Kucinich? No. Mr. Kucinich votes no. Mr. Bogloyevich? No. Mr. Bogloyevich votes no. Mr. Davis of Illinois? Mr. Tierney? Mr. Tierney votes no. Mr. Turner? Mr. Turner votes no. Mr. Allen? Mr. Allen votes no. Mr. Ford? Mr. Ford votes no. Mr. Gilman? Mr. Shays? Mr. Shays votes yes. Mr. Wise? Mr. Owens? Mr. Davis of Illinois? Uh, has everyone voted? Uh, the clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, there are 23 ayes and 17 nays. The uh, motion is uh, agreed to. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Cox of California for five minutes. I thank the chairman, uh, and I'd like to get us focused on the topic at hand, the question of the testimony of witnesses uh, before the committee, uh, the Justice Department has agreed that these people may testify before Congress, and uh, the purpose of our vote is to grant the immunity to which the Justice Department does not object so that we can hear from the witnesses' personal knowledge about how massive amounts of money from foreign sources were funneled into the 1996 elections. If we fail to immunize these witnesses, Americans may never learn what they know. A refusal to immunize these witnesses when the Justice Department has already told us they will not prosecute them and, uh, and does not object to the grant of immunity uh, is nothing but the four-corner stall that we have seen from the administration from the very outset of this investigation. Our task is very timely. Next week, the House will once more commence our debate and votes on campaign reform legislation. Yet if the minority has its way, we will do so without vital evidence of what went wrong in the most recent election, especially at the presidential level. We already know generally about the astonishing amount of private and even foreign money that went into a supposedly 100% taxpayer-financed election. According to investigative journalist Bob Woodward, not according to Chairman Burton, not according to this committee or its staff, but according to Bob Woodward of the Washington Post, quote, the Democratic National Committee functioned as the unofficial arm of the Clinton campaign, close quote. To raise and spend money during a period when the Clinton-Gore campaign was legally barred from doing so, a scheme Woodward called, quote, certainly in violation of the spirit of the law and possibly illegal. Bob Woodward could reach this conclusion on the basis of publicly available evidence, but Bob Woodward and the Washington Post don't have the power to compel the testimony of witnesses which the Clinton Justice Department is willing to put before this committee. We know precious little because of the vote to prevent these witnesses from testifying about the specific devices used by the Clinton campaign to corrupt the public financing system. Yet the public financing system, with its flaws, is one of the alternatives we may be called upon to consider next week when we talk about campaign finance reform. To fix this system, as the House will attempt to do in the coming days, we must understand how it failed. But the minority, at least in the last vote, has no intention of helping us discover that. Today, 
The minority stands alone in obstructing the grant of immunity for these witnesses because, as I said, the Clinton administration itself, the Clinton administration's own Justice Department, has no objection to the, the arrangements we are proposing today for these witnesses. And that fact not only deprives the minority of an argument, it underlines the importance of what we're doing here because it means, among other things, that the Justice Department has no intention of prosecuting these people and the only way the justice will be served is if we can put their testimony before the American people. There is particular irony in the party line vote of April 23rd and in the party line vote that we may see here again today. For months, the public has been expressing its concern over tobacco as a public health issue. Yet the most important of the four witnesses whose testimony we seek and whose testimony may be blocked by the party line vote today is the U.S. distributor of communist China's giant tobacco company, the manufacturer of Red Pagoda Mountain cigarettes. This is a pack of Red Pagoda Mountain cigarettes. I wouldn't smoke one of these things. I'd choke and gag on it. It's probably uh, more unhealthy than Camel cigarettes. Uh, this is uh, the third largest brand in the world, larger than Camel. And the guy who is the U.S. distributor for these communist Chinese cigarettes, Kent La, is the person whose testimony we're trying to get here. Kent La would testify about whether foreign tobacco money was funneled through John Huang to the Democratic National Committee and others before the 1996 elections. If our minority colleagues agree, Mr. La will testify about political contributions made by tobacco billionaire Ted Siong, his family, and their associates in the worldwide tobacco business. Those contributions totaled $400,000 to the Democratic National Committee just in 1996. All these contributions were solicited by John Wong. 50,000 of them came from Kent La himself. Let's get his testimony. Let's immunize this person as the Justice Department has agreed we shall do, and let's get the truth. We may differ about what the facts mean. We may differ about how we should respond to those facts. But we cannot, we must not, differ about whether to seek the facts. That's not a fair argument for this committee to have. It is acceptable, perhaps, to protest things that you don't like about being in the minority, but obstruction of justice is not an acceptable means of protest. Let's get the evidence. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Waxman, to whom do you delegate your first five minutes? Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Mr. Lantos. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I take the microphone not in anger but in sorrow because this process has clearly demeaned the Congress, which I love. And as a student of the history of the Congress, it's obvious to me that every successful congressional investigation has been a bipartisan on, uh, investigation and not a wildly partisan one. The basic assumption on which you have proceeded was that all the angels are on one side, and this flies in the face of common sense and the judgment of the American people. Now, of all the, the inflammatory statements you made in your opening remarks, the one that really sticks in my throat was your attempt to liken your performance to that of Congressman Lee Hamilton of Indiana. Lee Hamilton is one of the most universally respected and trusted members of this body. I spent 18 years sitting next to him on the Foreign Affairs Committee, and I have watched him work. I know Lee Hamilton. Lee Hamilton is a friend of mine, and you are no Lee Hamilton. <laughs> And that, Mr. Chairman, in a nutshell, is the fundamental dilemma that this committee faces. In order for the chairman to function effectively, he needs to be trusted and he needs to be respected, as Lee Hamilton was trusted by members on both sides, as Lee Hamilton was respected by members on both sides. Unfortunately, that is not the case with respect to this committee. 
And I believe that the earlier proceedings today merely provide the most recent example of an attempt to walk over the views, the proposals, the suggestions of those of us who happen to sit on this side of the aisle. There has never been a more effective demonstration of the truism that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. You have garnered to yourself absolute power in running this committee. And the results are present in editorials across this country, Republican papers and Democratic papers and independent papers. We are ready to vote immunity for these four people. We have as much interest in getting to the bottom of all these allegations as are our colleagues on the other side. But we will not be used as mere props, as decorations, as a pretense at bipartisanship by having us sit here. If we have no power in making any decision, if our views are never considered, if our motions are never allowed to be voted upon, we will have no option but to oppose your suggestion of immunity. The whole process of this committee is so contrary to the fundamental purpose of the Government Reform and Oversight Committee. All other committees legislate. We look into things. We find out whether there is wrongdoing in the Department of Housing and Urban Development, at the White House, any place. But we have to do it on a bipartisan basis. The attempt to ride roughshod over the Democrats on this committee and over fair play has backfired. This has become a circus and a soap opera. And those of us who are compelled to, uh, to sit on this committee under these circumstances have no option but to deny your request. I yield back the balance. Would the gentleman yield? I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Chairman, uh, the gentleman yields you yield back me for one moment? Uh, I, I will have to, under the rules, we'll have to have somebody that has uh, five minutes on our side yield to you, Mr. Scarborough. Uh, Mr. Horn, I think you're recognized next, and if you have a moment I'll, or two, I'll be you glad to yield one minute to the gentleman. I thank the gentleman. I'll be brief. I, I keep hearing Dan Burton's name being attacked by these people because he's not fair-minded, and yet these are the same comments we heard from Democrats when we had Bill Klinger, a moderate, running this committee, and in fact, when we tried to get information to get to the bottom of the 900 FBI files, we were stonewalled by a 19-0 to 0 vote, and the last speaker's only response was when Mr. Livingstone was before this committee was that he should kill himself. So I find it very difficult to listen to these protests and believe that they're any more than cynical uh, partisanship. And I yield back. The gentleman totally time. misstated the facts as Mr. usual. Mr. Horn has the time. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this should not be a partisan matter. It's very clear that the Clinton administration and the Department of Justice, headed by Attorney General Reno, have given their permission for us to immunize these particular witnesses. They are keys to various aspects of what have some have decided uh, seem to be troubling in some parts of our investigation, but various aspects of who paid whom with what money. Was it Chinese money? Was it businessmen within China? Uh, was it uh, uh, overseas Chinese? Who was it? The immunization of these particu this particular set of witnesses is absolutely essential. And the permission was given, and Mark uh, Richard, the acting assistant attorney general uh, in the criminal division, noted in his final sentence of most of these, we appreciate greatly your coordinating with us on this matter. And they've given permission. So I don't see how anyone in Congress can refuse the offer of this committee to immunize these witnesses. We have agreed with the Justice Department considerations in some of this, 
and it's just a simple matter of trying to get at the truth. And what bothers me here is Senator Thompson's campaign finance investigation, he was attacked, all but one member of the majority party. Mr. Senator Lieberman was very objective in how he went about it. Senator D'Amato's Whitewater investigation, he was attacked. Representative Leach, who I think most members of the House would put in the top two or three around here in terms of ethics, integrity, quietly effective, he was attacked when his banking committee investigated Whitewater. Representative Klinger's name was mentioned, a very distinguished person, a very fair person. He was bitterly attacked when he went after information concerning the travel office, the FBI files, all the rest of it. Now, needless to say, so was the independent counsel. And what I guess gets me the most is the attacks on the independent counsel, even uh, equal certainly to the attacks on congressional colleagues in the Senate and the House. And the fact is that the, uh, this has been orchestrated by the executive branch to undercut the credibility of the independent counsel in this case, whether it be Whitewater, FBI files, travel office, and the Lewinsky, Lewinsky matter. The fact is the people that are indicted are not indicted by the independent counsel, which seems to be the word spread. They are indicted by a federal grand jury who listen to the evidence as put before them by the independent counsel. And in a hearing a few uh, months ago, Mr. Free was uh, the uh, uh, d director of the FBI, uh, was asked the question, had he ever seen uh, similar actions in terms of people, a lot of them on this wall, who have fled the country, taken the Fifth Amendment, and what he had to say was, when the chairman asked him, have you ever experienced so many unavailable witnesses in any matter in which you've prosecuted or on which you've been involved? Mr. Free said, actually, I have. The chairman asked, you have? Give me a rundown on that real quickly. Mr. Free, director of the FBI, said, I spent about 16 years doing organized crime cases in New York City, and many people were frequently unavailable. Guess what? Many people have been frequently unavailable in this hearing, in Senator Thompson's hearing, and in this case, here are four witnesses that can help us get at the truth, and it's essential that this Congress grant immunity to these witnesses. And it's the right thing to do, and I think a lot of my friends on the other side of the aisle know that. I yield back the balance of my time. The Mr. gentleman Chair. yields back the balance of his time. Uh, who on the minority side uh, seeks time? Mr. Kinjorski? Mr. Kinjorski is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, uh, since our last hearing on this matter and what some people have described as a circus or a madhouse, I, I have tried to uh, sit back and analyze what's happening or what has happened. And I've come to the conclusion that the reason of the overwhelming criticism of the editorial boards and commentators across this country have seized upon the last two weeks is the fact that it is clearly now evident that on neither side of this committee is there truly a search for evidence and facts from which to make a conclusion. If you watched the talking heads, some of which are members of this committee over the last two weeks on national television, and I dare say your opening statement, you start off with the proposition of arriving at the conclusion that you want to see arrived at and you feel terribly frustrated with the facts that you've been unable to gain facts or evidence to substantiate that conclusion. And you wail away with the overall encompassing statements that everybody knows crimes are committed or scandals have occurred or things that were done that should shock the American people. And yet, we never hear those facts. We never hear that evidence. And even when a simple attempt 
by the ranking member of the committee to release depositions that have been taken out there to shed light on what we have in the mine, we are denied that right. I'm not sure at what point we're going to arrive at the conclusion that there are no conclusions yet of criminality or scandal. There are allegations. There are no charges. I know of no charges pending against the President of the United States or his wife in regard to Whitewater, Filegate, Travelgate, and now whatever this can be called, Campaign Finance Gate. But then I heard in your opening statement a very serious charge against the minority members of this committee. And you used the word that we were stonewalling. I like these Orwellian words that are so thrown out there to emotionally establish in people's minds that we're doing something evil. And then you went on to cite five or six examples having nothing to do with the minority of this committee. It was the executive branch. It was the witnesses that won't show up. It's the ones that have left the country. They're stone. Well, the, that, if that stone wall up there is for them, why are you saying this committee is stone wall? Now, when I've listened to all these editors and read all these commentators across the country, I've come to the conclusion that the other side of the aisle may want to characterize stone wall. But you know, I've come to the conclusion that the American people, the brighter and more intelligent commentators and editorialists of this country are beginning to believe that this committee does not suffer from stonewall on this side, but that the entire committee should be holding its hearing in a chamber with padded walls. <laughs> and that, that is not, it's, it, it is humorous, but it's only humorous because it, it's so close to what the truth is. We have now embarrassed this committee. We have now embarrassed the House of Representatives. We are going on to embarrass the institutions of government we love and pledge to serve so well. Do you know what, Mr. Chairman? I was in my district this last weekend. We're starting to embarrass the American people. And I would suggest that the majority side take very seriously our offer. We want to immunize witnesses and gain facts. We want to establish evidence of wrongdoing so that we can prepare ourselves to legislate properly to avoid that in the future and prosecute any uh, past occasions. But this ship is sailing nowhere except on a rough sea of partisanship. And it's very unfortunate that we, as members of this body, have degraded ourselves so much. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The chair now recognizes Mr. Micah of Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, my committee members, uh, the issue before us today is whether this committee grant immunity to four witnesses in conducting our probe of illegal uh, contributions in the 1996 federal election. Mr. Chairman, I believe that Machiavelli would be proud of the subversive and obstructive tactics employed by the Democrats on this panel and their co-conspirators in the White House to delay, to detract, to divert attention, and to undermine this investigation. Every member of com Congress should be personally offended by the undeserved sliming of the chairman of this committee and other committee members. Fortunately, Mr. Chairman, history, facts, and our judicial system will pre prevail. Because of the very nature of our system of government, I believe that tyranny and political corruption eventually are unmasked. I believe the sheer number of scandals and crimes will astound historians. Seven independent councils. Last week, another independent council dealing with Indo Indonesian campaign uh, money. Unprecedented numbers of investigative targets taking the Fifth Amendment. Put that chart up there. 
the greatest foreign assault in the history of our republic uh, on our national, our very national elections process. The utter disregard, contempt, and unprecedented abuse of law and rules by which we elect our Congress and the President of the United States. Now let me deal with facts rather than rhetoric as we've heard from the other side today. The facts in this investigation speak for themselves, the way we conducted this hearing. I served on this panel in the 103rd Congress. We were given five investigative staffers for 55 investigative staffers on the Democrat side. I'll ask that this be put in the record afterward. This shows the percentage of staff, and these are from the clerk's records of how they abuse power and uh, how, in fact, we have divided resources for this investigation in a fair and bipartisan manner. 25% uh, of the staff, to be correct, in 96, it was 24.7% last year was uh, given to the other side to conduct this investigation. Subpoenas issued, we've issued 606. Director of FBI, and I have his testimony here, he said he issued over 1,000. Put up, put up the, uh, the chart, the last chart, the very last chart. This chart shows campaign financing, I'm sorry, campaign fundraising investigation, convictions, and indictment. If they're saying we're conducting a partisan investigation, what is the FBI and the Department of Justice doing? These are the individuals who have pled guilty uh, and have been convicted. Uh, and every one of them, uh, unfortunately, is part of the other uh, side of the aisle. Uh, this, the facts speak for themselves about what we have done, about what the Ju Department of Justice has done. I have a list of members of Congress who received uh, foreign campaign contributions to Republicans in columns and columns of Democrats. I didn't produce that. That was produced uh, by roll call on Thursday, March 6, 1997. Let's, let's deal with the facts again. The fact is the other side had an opportunity when they controlled the House, the White House, and the Senate to change the independent counsel law. They, in fact, renewed it. They, in fact, created the three-judge panel. The fact is that the, the Clinton appoint, appointee, the attorney general, and the new system they set up uh, brought all this to bear on the other side, the widening of Whitewater, Filegate, Travelgate, and now uh, Monica Gate. The fact is the Democrats keep saying it it's taken too long. They have fought su subpoenas. They failed to give requested records on every almost every occasion. They've invoked uh, executive privilege. And when the, these issues have been taken to the, court, uh, the courts, they've lost every single time. This, the, the investigative and oversight responsibilities of this committee were first established in 1808 by our founders, and they're being shaken to the very core, uh, uh, the, their very core today by this challenge. This committee uh, encompasses a unique structure of checks and balances, and that, uh, ch that structure of checks and balances is being destroyed in a concerted effort to un uh, uncovering the truth, stonewalling not only Congress but the American people. And I'm quite fa frankly disgusted with the tactics that have been used by the administration and some folks on the other side to disrupt this investigation. Everything possible has been done to uh, destroy this investigation, and I think uh, it is a, a real shame and a sham on this Congress, this committee, and the American people. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, we have a vote on the floor. Would any other members of the minority like to have five minutes before we go? Yes, Ms. Yes. Maloney, we'll recognize yes, you for five yes, minutes. Yes, I would, Mr. Chairman. A as I mentioned on the floor last night, I haven't seen this much bungling since I watched uh, Professor Clouseau investigate the uh, Pink Panther. Tapes are being doctored. The lead investigator has been forced to step down. 
We've all been labeled squealing pigs, and the Sunday morning talk shows are all about us on this committee. What's next? Ofra, Jerry Springer? We've been complaining about the subpoenas the chairman issued without committee consent. We pointed out the outrageous expense of these fruitless investigations. We've endured name calling of the President of the United States and the abuse of witnesses. Now it's not just us complaining. Editorial boards across this nation are speaking out. Uh, let me refer to one of my hometown papers, the New York Times. It wrote last Friday, and it's up on the board over there in the wake of the release of the Hubble tapes, and I quote, by now, even Representative Dan Burton ought to recognize that he's become an impediment to a serious investigation of the 1996 campaign finance scandals. If the House inquiry is to be responsible, someone else on Mr. Burton's committee should run it. Mr. Burton, a fierce partisan, not known for balanced judgment, was plainly the wrong man for a sensitive job. Another hometown newspaper, The Daily News, and I quote, Burton is an obvious clown, but even clowns can do real damage. Privacy destroyed, reputation sullied, legal bills incurred. There is an easy way to rein in Burton. House Speaker Newt Gingrich can and should give Burton's leash a sharp pull, end quote. And today, in this morning's Washington Post, it quotes Republican sources saying that Mr. Burton's so-called wounds are self-inflicted. Regarding the unilateral issuance of subpoenas, Republican sources are saying, and I quote, I don't think Burton realized the implications of his position. It's like he can't help himself, end quote. One respected analyst, Norm Ornstein, of the American Enterprise Institute says, and I quote, from day one, Dan Burton did almost everything he could to destroy any chance that this would be seen as a bipartisan effort, end quote. In, in my opinion, there are skeletons in closets on both sides of the aisle. The real answer is to reform the system. In the meantime, we must reform this committee. I would like uh, really to put into the record, if I could, Mr. Chairman, a um, statistics that were, were prepared by the minority staff that responds to the majority's internet uh, page stating that 90 witnesses have fled or pled their Fifth Amendment rights. And uh, the minority staff analyzes and reveals that this count is substantially overstated. Uh, many of the individuals listed are either currently cooperating with the Justice Department or have been indicted or convicted. And I'd like to put this analysis into the record, and I'd like to yield the without remainder. Obje without objection. Thank you very much, Serving Mr. Chairman. the right to object, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I wouldn't object if I'm allowed to put into the record uh, this, the uh, list uh, that we have that details uh, those who have fled the country, those who have uh, uh, pled the, the Fifth Amendment, uh, and the other categories the ladies are talking about. Uh, without objection, uh, both of those will be put in the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think that's a legitimate will, request. We will, we will, the will facts not, will speak for themselves. We will not deduct from your time because of that interlude. Uh, go ahead, Ms. Maloney, you want to yield somewhere? Would the gentlewoman yield for a question? I, I would like to yield to Eleanor Holmes Norton, who has requested time. How much time do I have? Uh, how much time does, uh, is remaining? About a minute and a half, Ms. Norton. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, I uh, regret being forced into an action of last resort. Um, the only kinds of actions of last resort I've had to take in my life have normally been related to my work in the civil rights movement when there was nothing else to do but, but uh, do something irregular. And th thus, I would like to explain my vote. This is not an immunity vote. This is a protest vote. Nobody uh, would, 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 would have any reason uh, to vote no when there is no Justice Department objection. Why are the Democrats doing this? It is important for the American people to know that uh, the minority has been driven to this action 
because there was no other action left to be taken. Uh, our rights have been withdrawn, and essentially one man has subpoena power. In our system of justice, that is unheard of. Even the prosecutor has a grand jury, and indeed, most chairs would want the institution behind them when exercising subpoena power. What is next then? Instead of negotiating the matter out, as is almost always done in a situation of this kind, we will transfer uh, the authority to the House Oversight Committee. Why? Because there, that committee has been stacked. When the Democrats controlled Congress, the vote, the vote, the ratio was 12 to 7. The ratio now is 6 to 3. Uh, a stack committee is going to vote immunity when this committee, committee was prepared to vote immunity today if we could do what reasonable men and women always do in this kind of situation, and that is simply negotiate the matter out and get on with our business. I'm sorry, Ms. Norton, your time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have a vote on the floor. The chair will stand in recess. The committee will stand in recess, and I wish every member would get back as quickly as possible so we can conclude, conclude our business. The chair now recognizes a gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Souter, for five minutes. I can't begin to express how disappointed I am by this process today. Those who've watched the hearings, and uh, not only in this committee, but other committees, know that I'm a uh, partisan when I need to be partisan, and I'm a fierce conservative. But I'm also willing to listen to both sides. I've worked with Mr. Fatah in the High Hopes education process. I've I've been willing to buck my party when necessary. I've been willing to say when I've had concerns in this committee, I've been willing to say when I've had concerns with our, our speaker. I've even, and, the, and those in the media know this, have said kind things about Mr. Waxman, who I believe in many cases is an open-minded person. But I am distressed at the continuing attempt to always find a reason, no matter what we're doing in this hearing, to always find a reason why we can't pursue the truth. I have not said that I believe the president is guilty of anything. I believe that some have wondered, because it certainly smells a lot in the administration, whether he is. It's clear some people have done something wrong. It's clear when 91 people say that they've taken the fifth or fled the country, that they certainly believe there is something in their testimony that they believe is not legal or they can't exercise that right, that somehow it could incriminate themselves in some way or that they fled the country because they didn't want it to get out or because maybe they would have to either roll over or lie under oath. So clearly there is something rotten here and our goal should be to try to find out what that is. The fact is, is the Democrats lost the election. They don't get to pick the chairman of this committee. That, that it is a ruse to try to deflect the subject at hand away. They have been making continual allegations against the chairman of this committee rather than focusing on the, at what looks like the obstruction of justice, if not by the president, then by at least somebody in the administration, and certainly counseling people in, in many cases, as we've heard, not to, to come forward. Uh, like I say, I didn't say that about the president. I said somebody is, and we need to find out who it is. It's enough that we have all these uh, special investigations. We, have, we just heard another one of the allegations that, that the documents were doctored. The, doctor, the documents were not doctored. I wish those words were in, and I think it wasn't just a mistake. If there was anything that was deliberate with that, it was a terrible mistake because it took the, the subject offhand. But we're not doctored. Doctored is an inflammatory word that goes to motive. We don't know for sure what happened with this, and people shouldn't be prejudging, and certainly the chairman did not doctor. Even if it was deliberately left out, that's different than doctoring. And the type of rhetoric that's being used here on both sides needs to cool down. The fact is that in front of us are witnesses who are now ready to talk. 91 have either fled the country or taken the fifth. Five are ready to talk. So what do we have? Another excuse as to why they shouldn't talk. Now, there's been concern that I and others are upset that it looks like 
that there is a spin going on the other side. It looks like they are cooperating in a cover-up. I heard uh, my fellow Hoosier Lee Hamilton referred to as whether, well as my fellow Hoosier Dan Burton. The fact is, is Lee Hamilton had these powers. What he didn't have, and, and that's not a matter of dispute, that's, he had the rules to be able to do things unilaterally, but the Republicans didn't force it. And that I watched many of these hearings, both as a staff person and as somebody going up as Congress investigated different people, and I heard people on both sides actually asking questions of witnesses to try to get to the truth. The people who followed these hearings and the press who's followed these hearings who, who write the stories that get to the people know full well that generally speaking on the other side when we have a hearing, that there are exceptions, and I'm going to name a few. Mr. Barrett has had a number of questions over time that have been legitimate questions to get to the inquiry. So has Mr. Sanders. When we had the files, he separated himself from the bulk and actually asked some substantive questions on the files. But generally speaking, in Indiana, we'd have an expression, the number of members who actually asked substantive questions to get to the truth, rather than to try to help the witnesses spin another story. You could count them on one hand and have enough fingers left to bowl. It has been a disappointing process in this committee to see for one excuse or another why a certain witness shouldn't be asked these questions here, why we shouldn't pursue it here, and instead it's Dan Burton did this, the committee did this, this is too partisan, they've made an allegation in the media somewhere. The question at hand is, we have five witnesses who finally want to talk. Are we going to stuff something down their throat? Are we going to gag them? We heard this morning that this was a gag rule. No, this is a 60-minute debate. How about having 60 minutes for each of the witnesses and stop misusing words like gag rules? We, I heard it was unheard of not to allow the minority to have votes. We've had plenty of votes in this committee. We have so many votes in this committee, and then people ask, why aren't you doing other substantive work of the House? Why aren't you at other committees? Because we have constant votes over in this committee. We've, we vote in this committee. The question today is, are we going to shove a rag down the mouth of five people who finally want to come forward and talk? And why are people so afraid to let these people talk? Could it be they're going to lead to another person or another person? We hear about it being committee process. This is not committee process. This is the question, are these people going to be gagged? I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Uh, who on your side this each time? Mr. Barrett? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I feel like we need marriage counseling. Uh, when I listen to the two different sides here, we are talking past each other like two people who have lived together for 45 years and have nothing in common before uh, any, anymore. But it's, this, is, this is not a happy experience, certainly for me. Uh, and I look back and I hear the comments that we have somehow been stonewalling. Bear in mind that the first action that we Democrats took that slowed down anything in this committee occurred three weeks ago. This is not something that has been happening for the last year and a half. It was three weeks ago that we voted against immunity. And I'm comfortable with that vote. And let me tell you why. Last year, when we first started our work in this committee, of course we asked to have Republicans investigated as well as Democrats. That's natural. If you were in the minority, you would have asked the same thing as well. We felt that it should be a fair investigation because I don't think that Republicans have raised their money from widows and orphans. I think that there is too much money in this system. I think that this system needs a lot of change. And if we're going to change it, we have to do it by looking at the excesses of both sides. But we felt from day one that there was absolutely no interest by the majority in looking into that. But that's fine. As my friend from Indiana pointed out, we're in the minority. And you call the shots. So we move on from there. We go from there, and the summer continues. And for me, frankly, what, what happened, um, when we had the vote on immunity last October, that was a difficult vote for me. It was a difficult vote because I had never voted for immunity before. And that's not something that I think anybody who's elected to Congress or any public office takes lightly. That's a difficult vote. You are excusing someone from allegations of legal wrongdoing. You are giving them a blessing to go and sin no more, even if they've sinned. Um, so that was a difficult vote. That was a difficult vote to do, but I did it. Then what happens? We find out that there were problems with that. And one of the individuals who had been given immunity um, may have immigration problems, may have tax problems, and we had just immunized them. So that destroys or at least hampers my confidence in, in the ability of this committee to perform its duty. But I'm going to be very frank. The straw that broke this camel's back were the statements that were made by the committee chairman 
with respect to the president and his statement that he was out to get the president. And Mr. Chairman, I like you. I like you. But I think that this committee is not a search for the truth. This committee is designed for one purpose only, and that is to try to destroy the president. Now, when people ask me what it's like to serve on this committee as a Democrat, I tell them it's, sometimes it's not so pleasant. Because again, frankly, there are some things that, that we have seen and heard that I don't particularly want to defend. So I'm given a choice, either defend some things you don't want to defend, or sit here and let the Republicans kick you in the teeth. Because they're not interested in fairness. And I'm just not going to do that. So when the committee chairman calls the President of the United States a term that I would not use in public, I will not utter the term. I think most people in this room know what the term is, but I don't feel comfortable uttering it. My colleague, Ms. Maloney, said that if her kids used that term, she'd wash their mouth out with soap. And I agree with her. He then went on to say, that's why I'm out to get the president. When a committee chairman, whose job is to be fair, says that he's out to get the president, to me, that destroys the credibility of the committee. It is no longer an attempt to find fairness. It is no longer an attempt to find the truth. It's purely a partisan witch hunt. And that is where I draw the line. Now, ironically, that vote occurred prior to the release of the Hubble tapes. And certainly, the day or two after we had voted against it, the majority was on the offensive, saying, talking about the 19 who voted against immunity. Well, they started backpedaling mighty quickly after the Hubble tapes were released, and they backpedaled even faster. I've never seen anybody ride a bicycle backwards so fast in my life when it turned out that portions were dropped, changed, doctored, you can use whatever word you like. But I think that we all agree that, that there were relevant portions of those tapes that were not released. And that is when the American people and the press realized what's going on here, that this is not a search for the truth. And I think, that it, I think it's disturbing. Mr. Micah was talking about the abuses that occurred when the Democrats were in the majority. He was saying how we misused the resources and we had too many people. He probably is right. So what did the American people do? They threw us out of control. They weren't saying we want another group to come in and abuse the system. What they were saying with that election is we want the abuses to stop, not that we just want different people to abuse the system. So no, I am not happy with what's transpired here today. I'm not happy what's trans with what's transpired in this committee the last year and a half, but I am at peace because until I believe that this committee has credibility, I am comfortable in voting no on immunity. And I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Uh, Mr. Shattig, you recognize for five minutes. I thank the chairman for yielding and uh, want to begin by setting the record straight because uh, apparently we not only need marriage counseling, we also need some memory refreshers. Uh, my colleague, Mr. Barrett, just said, and I believe this is a direct quote, I tried to write it down as quickly as I could and as accurately as I could, the first thing that we on this committee ever did to slow down the investigation was three weeks ago. I wish that that were true, but it is clearly not true. And I would cite to you a letter which perhaps you forgot that you signed. Um, on October 22nd of 1997, well over six months ago, you signed a letter to the chairman of this committee in which you said point blank that you intend not to agree to ever support immunity again uh, for witnesses before this committee unless three conditions were met. Those three conditions required that the rules of the committee be changed. Well, it's very fine to want to have the rules of the committee changed, but in point of fact, we adopted the rules of this committee at the beginning of the year. And what you did back in October was to say, and Mr. Waxman has said it repeatedly, and the notion that he has just said it in the last few weeks in response to the release of the Hubble tapes is flat wrong. Because the author of this letter was Mr. Waxman, every member of the committee signed it, and it said, we intend to assist, insist, on a new approach before supporting future requests for immunity. Now, it's been widely reported that the Democrats on this committee are refusing to grant immunity to these four witnesses, and that that is a result of the deterioration they see of the functioning of the committee in the last year. Well, the but gentleman yield. Fact, but in point of fact, no, I made my statement without asking you to yield. I'd like to. Well, you referred to me. Point of personal privilege. If you referred to me, I'd like to be able to respond. I think a little courtesy <laughs> might Mr. be Mr. Shattuck has the time. Um, I want to just finish putting into the record this letter, and I have highlighted your signature, Mr. Barrett, in which you say. 
Unless we change the rules of the committee, you have no intention of granting immunity to any witness. So the notion that you first said that three weeks ago is simply wrong. The second point I'd like to put into the record is that you went on to say that you are outraged at the st statements by the chairman about the president, that that pushed you over the edge. I, I would request that you find quotes in the press where you condemned Senator Kerry when he said that the president is an exceptionally good liar, exceptionally good. I will tell you, I think to call someone a liar is an extraordinary accusation in this business. It's a, an accusation that I try to never, ever, ever do because the truth is hard to find and different people have different views. But Senator Kerry, who once served as the chairman of the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee, said five, six months ago, direct quote, the president is an exceptionally good liar, exceptionally good. Now, I would like to see where the members of your committee, the members of the Democrat members of this panel, expressed their outrage at that remark by Senator Kerry. I think the answer is we'll find very, very few expressions of outrage uh, over that statement by Senator Kerry, a Democrat. I'm certain that the chairman uh, acted in anger when he said what he said. But I think it is very, very important that we put emotion aside, that we put the reaction to a statement by the chairman of this committee made perhaps in heat, though quite frankly, I believe the word was po proposed to him by the editorial board and he simply agreed to it. I suggest that we have a higher calling and that higher calling is to do what's good for the country. What I have not heard today from anyone on the other side is an expl explanation of why we should not grant immunity to Irene Wu or Nancy Lee or Larry Wong or Kent Law. I have not heard that from anyone on this committee during the entire course of this hearing. I have heard summaries of what they would say. At the last hearing at which we conducted on this issue, um, I put into the record summarizations of what each of those witnesses would testify to. And I read them into the record, and after reading them into the record, made it at the end of each one of them, after discussing Irene Wu and her role and what knowledge she had about illegal campaign contributions, I pointed out that the Department of Justice did not oppose the granting of immunity to her. And I said, I don't understand why anyone would vote not to grant her immunity since it is the Clinton Justice Department which does not oppose granting her immunity. I did the same thing with Nancy Lee and read into the record exactly what she knows, what we believe she knows, and what we believe she will testify to. I did the same thing with Larry Wong and pointed out again, by the way, with regard to Nancy Lee, that the Department of Justice, the Clinton Department of Justice, did not oppose granting con congressional immunity to Nancy Lee. I did the same thing with Larry Wong and I did the same thing with Kent Law. The most important of these is Kent Law. Kent Law has vitally important information which the people of America deserve to mm -hmm. know. Now, I understand that emotions run high and that you might get into a point of peak where you think you're going to punish somebody by saying, by God, we're never going to grant immunity again unless you do this or you do that. I just think it's important for the American people to understand that you are, A, demanding that the rules of the committee, which were agreed to and voted upon at the beginning of this year, be changed, that you are demanding that they be changed now, that you demanded last October that they be changed, and clear back last October, you said, we are going to stonewall this committee and nothing more will happen because we will not grant immunity until you change the rules of the game. Sadly, it's very much like we're going to take our football and go home if you don't play with us. Well, the rules are set, and the American people deserve to know what these witnesses would say. Point of personal privilege. The gentleman's uh, time has expired. Has point of personal privilege. The ge uh, gentleman will state his point of personal uh, The gentleman referred to me and accused me of misstating the facts. I'd like in 30 seconds to correct that, if I may. The gentleman's recognized for 30 seconds. I think if you wrote the statement down, I think my statement was that the first action that we took to slow down, which slowed down this process, took place three weeks ago. I stand by that statement. That letter did not slow down this process. Frankly, I thought that that letter would be responded to and that we would work out the differences. Perhaps my, my sin, if I have a sin, was that I was naive. I thought that we would be yeah. able to resolve the differences. I obviously couldn't. I felt that yeah. there should have been a proffer. That's what they do in, in the Star investigations. I thought that we would, at some point, start following professional measures here. Uh, who on uh, the Democrat side seeks time? Mr. Patah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, for one, have tried 
desperately to refrain from criticizing the chairman because I also uh, like the chairman. And plus, I don't think it's productive. I mean, the personalities really not the issue here. It's the process and the end product for this committee's work. And sadly, the selective amnesia that it seems to be uh, present in some of the comments of some of my colleagues. Uh, this committee's work was supposed to look at illegal campaign finances. The chairman asserted at every point when I raised this issue that he was going to look wherever the evidence Followed. He promised me, he committed in an open hearing that we were going to look at the triad arrangement. Um, the whole grand jury that's now investigating Haley Barber and the activities of the Republican National Committee. The fact that in terms of convictions of people who violated the election laws in 1996, we've seen um, many more of them on the Republican side, including the Dole Finance Chairman, who was indicted and convicted of funneling money through a Hong Kong bank and back to his employees and had to pay a $8 million fine, a, another company uh, in my home state that had to pay a $5 billion fine. Uh, we saw foreign nationals, including uh, arms dealers, uh, donating to the Speaker's campaign and the like. The point of the minority is, is that even though we lost the last election, as it's been put, is that if this is an investigation of illegal campaign finances, it should be more even-handed. And the process under which we go by it should at least have some respect for minority viewpoints, unless you don't want the minority to have any uh, participation in this process. If that's the case, then you can't be disappointed that we won't give you votes for immunity. I, for one, have no problem voting for immunity for these witnesses. And, and I don't believe there's any Democrat here who has a problem with it. What we have a problem with is the notion that you can like run roughshod over any suggestion, any motion, anything that we think the committee should look at, and then suspect that on any given whim, we're going to give you the two-thirds votes that you need. Now, it was an unfortunate slip, but a prophetic one when uh, my colleague from Pennsylvania, Ken Jorsky, mentioned in the opening hearing that the chairman and the majority could have its way but they were going to, that we were going to come to a day in which there was going to be a need for two-thirds votes on these issues of immunity. That was ignored. And so I have every desire to want to cooperate. Um, and there are many people on the, on, the, uh, on the majority side who I work with on a number of matters. There are a few who have prejudged this matter. But if, you know, I think that since they've done that in the public, and the public is fully aware of the comments that they've made or the actions that they've taken, that the public can then figure that out in this process. But if we're looking for illegal campaign finances in the 1996 election, we cannot ignore the notion that the chairman of the Republican Party went to a foreign land, arranged for a multi-million dollar uh, loan that went in and eventually was the the, the, result, the result of that was that it helped finance uh, some 60 congressional races. And so our only point is, is that there are matters on both sides that need to be looked into. And if we can have a 90-10 or a 70-30 split on subpoenas, if we can bring forth some witnesses ourselves, then this committee could act a little bit more like what it should act in the way that the Senate operated than the way it's acted now. And to ignore our desires is foolhardy. It creates a circumstance and an impasse, which arrives us at a point in which with some 30 legislative days left in this year, after spending millions of dollars, this committee may in fact have to fold its hands and accomplish little or nothing. And I want to yield uh, the rest of my time back, because uh, I would not want to waste the committee's time as we rush to this vote, since we know what the outcome is going to be. Thank you. Chairman yields back the balance of his time. Congressman Barr is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think the uh, the last speaker said it very accurately that the other side has already made up their mind. That's that's obvious. I'm I'm sorry to hear that. I think it was Winston Churchill that once said that every once in a while mankind will stumble over the truth, but it will inevitably pick itself up, dust off its clothes, and keep right on going. That does seem to be the case here with regard to the search for the truth in these matters that bring us before uh, the American people today and which has consumed a great deal of 
legitimately of uh, the Congress's time and this committee's time over the last year and a half, and that is to search for the truth. Uh, unfortunately, in this case, uh, we're not even able to get to the point where the other side trips over the truth, dusts off the clothes, dusts off their clothes, and keep on going because they keep us from even getting to the truth. Our Constitution uh, is a marvelous document, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it does provide uh, a legitimate constitutional protection for individuals against incriminating themselves, something that every school child knows from watching television and reading books and stories. Uh, that is the Fifth Amendment. Our federal court system and this Congress in previous years, going back decades, not just recently, recognizes, though, that that prohibition against uh, somebody testifying against themselves uh, could, if, uh, if there's not some way found to get around it, bring the wheels of justice to an absolute standstill in our country. Therefore, over the years, a case law uh, has then been developed based on federal statutes found uh, in uh, Chapter 601 of Title 18 of the United States Code, which uh, discusses immunity of witnesses. As a former United States attorney, I can tell members on the other side that were it not for the power of U.S. attorneys and the Attorney General to seek court orders of immunity to force the truth to be told, notwithstanding the Fifth Amendment, uh, that many cases that I would think would be of importance to them would never have been prosecuted and countless money launderers, drug traffickers, bank robbers, and con artists that prey on their citizens and their constituents as well would be on the streets. Therefore, it really baffles me why uh, they are stonewalling and blocking efforts to get at the truth by exercising a legitimate and long-standing tool provided in Title 18 of the United States Code. There are certain mechanisms laid out in Title 18 of the United States Code in Section 6001 through 6005, and it provides for the process whereby uh, the Congress, or committees thereof, or the Attorney General, or the head of an agency, or a United States Attorney can apply to a federal court for an order of immunity. Those procedures normally, in such cases as the Department of Justice, as the Chief Prosecuting Authority for the United States of America, has already determined that it is indeed in the best interest of the people of this country to proceed, then it is normally a matter of routine for either the federal agency uh, at question, or in this case, the Committee of the Congress of the United States to vote for immunity, because it is very frequently the only way that the truth can be arrived at. In this case, there is ample evidence of criminal activity, notwithstanding the protestations, disingenuous as they are to the contrary, by the other side. One has only to look at uh, one of the uh, charts that we had here, campaign fundraising investigation, convictions, and indictments. I would uh, urge my colleagues on the other side to look up the definition of a conviction or an indictment, both of which are predicated on evidence of criminal activity. What we are trying to do in this committee is to try and further that process to find out exactly what has happened with regard to the criminal conduct that is already a matter of public record, yet the other side continues to refuse to see. And I think the uh, indictments also are based on evidence of criminal uh, activity. One might uh, look up a definition of indictment and what a grand jury does and what evidence is presented to a grand jury. One might uh, look up a definition of indictment and what a grand jury does and what evidence is presented to a grand jury. Uh, we are seeing, Mr. Chairman, the ramifications of the apparent criminal activity by this administration, even uh, with regard to evidence that or comments here today with regard to uh, foreign money coming in. We uh, already see statements by the Indian government, Mr. Chairman, uh, that indicate that the reason they detonated uh, the uh, nuclear uh, weapons uh, recently, these are statements by the Indian government itself through the press, uh, was because of the technology that is prevented, provided to China, missile technology by this country. The chairman and this committee and other members of this Congress are trying to determine whether or not there is, in fact, any link between the monies, the foreign monies that we know have already come in. Uh, we are trying to find out the details of that to see exactly what happened and to fill in the blanks, yet we are continually thwarted in that effort. And I must say that the obstruction by the other side goes beyond simply uh, a slap in the face of the American people. It goes beyond a slap in the face that the judicial institutions of this country as laid out in Title 18 based on our Constitution, but it also is a direct 
slap at the national security of this country. And I would urge my colleagues, despite the fact that they keep telling us that they've already made up their mind, to look at the broader ramifications of what we're trying to do here, to go beyond personalities, to understand what immunity is, to understand its very sound constitutional and legal basis, and to also look at the possible ramifications of what we're trying to get at here in terms of our national security. If the evidence is not there, then that's fine, but at least help us get to the truth, not pick ourselves up st after we stumble over it and keep going merrily on about our way. I thank the chair. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, who seeks time? Mr. Cummins. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, as I listened to the entire discussion, I think one of the things that concerns me is that one of our colleagues on the other side said that we should move to a higher calling. And I agree, we should move to a higher calling. And I think what our ranking member said from the very beginning of these hearings today about all of us taking responsibility and not having unilateral actions by our chairman is being called to that, is a call for a higher calling. But there is another factor that goes into that formula of higher calling, and that is fairness. It is uh, this side's contention that we've been in a situation where our committee has been called a circus, not by Republicans or Democrats, but by journalists all over this country. They've said that we cannot conduct a fair hearing. They've said that we cannot conduct a merit hearing. And as a new member of the Congress, I must tell you that I am very disappointed. I'm disappointed that we go back and forth, not getting to the very point that we're supposed to be getting to, and that is some kind of campaign finance reform, trying to make sure that we do the right thing. As, a as the American public looks at this, I wonder what they feel. I wonder what they feel when they hear about us spending millions and min upon millions of dollars to hold these investigations when they cannot even find the money to put their kids through college, when they cannot afford homes that they want to buy, when they cannot afford to do the things that go to the very essence of, of their lives. I, I wonder how they feel. I can tell you how the people in my district feel. They feel as if this is a committee out of control. And what they want is some closure to all of this so that they can, they'd much prefer that their tax dollars be spent in an effective and cost-efficient way. And so I hope that we do move to that higher calling and move to it swiftly. Mr. Chairman, I uh, yield a minute to my uh, colleague, Mr. Bogunovich. Um, thank you, uh, Congressman Cummings. Let me just briefly say, I think there's a way around this impasse, and we're obviously at one, and that's very simple, and that's simply to change the rules that we've been operating under for the last 16 to 18 months that has resulted in the kind of impasse that we presently are confronted with. Give to the minority members of this committee the same rights and the same role as is given to the members in the Senate and the Thompson Committee as was given during the Watergate Committee and the Iran-Contra Committee. And if that simple change is allowed, I think it's very clear, as our ranking member said, that we'll be eager to work with you with regard to immunity and other issues. But the fact is, we're not allowed to play a real role in this investigation. And it's awfully hard for us to simply sit here after one grant of immunity already to allow us to be simply rubber stamps for an investigation that has, and I think it's fair to say, been somewhat partisan in its approach. Having said that, I uh, return my time to Congressman Conner. Reclaiming my time, I, I yield to, uh, the balance of my time to Mr. Tierney. Thank you. I just want to make a few brief statements. I think we have to go a little bit beyond what Mr. Bogoyevich was talking about, and I think we have to address how this uh, investigation is conducted. Uh, we really have to go to who's going to be leading this situation. I think that we have a lack of confidence in the current chairman, and I think that that's something that we ask the majority to join with us on in terms of getting back some credibility for this particular process, as well as changing the protocol and the rules to go along with what we had in the Senate and in other investigations that have been seen by the public as being worthwhile and investigations that had credibility 
we need to put somebody in charge who is, is going to take this uh, to the level which it deserves to be at. We've seen some poor judgment, starting right with staff choices and, and a failure to rely on lead counsel and instead go to investigators to make important determinations that are being made upon the wrong basis. We've seen a procedural deviation from the normal protocols that committees of this nature generally take in this House. We've seen rank partisanship, a repeated failure to investigate uh, abuses by any party uh, that might be responsible and instead a, a, an intent to just go forward on a noted bias that's been publicly recognized. Uh, we've seen incredible incompetence time after time, uh, depositions that go on forever, witnesses being called back innumerable times to repeat testimony that they had before the Senate uh, in depositions before the Department of Justice, even uh, repeating testimony they've had in depositions in this committee on prior occasions and being inconvenienced and put to great expense to come back time and time again with no apparent uh, focus or reason. We've seen an incredible lack of fiscal responsibility shown on this as we continue to waste money recreating the wheel that the Department of Justice and the Thompson Committee in the, in the Senate has done. Uh, we are sending great deals of the public's money out with no apparent uh, purpose or, or role on this. Uh, we've certainly seen a lack of trustworthiness, uh, an inability to rely on someone who would change the content of tapes and the transcripts and, and release them to the public over the advice of his own uh, counsel. Uh, and even in the indications where the House does dismiss a certain investigator, we find out now that that investigator continues Gentleman's to occupy an office and to uh, carry on business as if it were normal. Gentleman's we see a lack of confidence even by the Chairman's own peers. Gentleman's and I think time that is uh, a need to go forward. If we had more time, we could go down the comments that those peers have Gentleman's made on the record and the editorials to show that this country no longer has the kind of confidence and the leadership Regular of this order. committee to warrant its continuation. The gentleman's time has expired. Regular order. The question is on resolutions. Uh, all time has expired. The question is on the resolutions granting congressional immunity to Irene Wu, Nancy Lee, Larry Wong, and Kent Law offered in block. All those in favor of the resolution signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed signify by saying no. no. In the opinion of the chair, roll two th roll. a roll call has been ordered and will be granted. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burton? Mr. Burton votes aye. Mr. Gilman? Mr. Gilman votes aye. Mr. Hastert? Mr. Hastert votes aye. Mrs. Morella? Mrs. Morella votes aye. Mr. Shays? Mr. Shays votes aye. Mr. Cox? Mr. Cox votes aye. Ms. Ross Layton? Ms. Ross Layton votes aye. Mr. McHugh? Mr. McHugh votes aye. Mr. Horn? Mr. Micah? Mr. Micah votes aye. Mr. Davis of Virginia? Mr. Davis of Virginia votes aye. Mr. McIntosh? Mr. McIntosh votes aye. Mr. Souter? Mr. Scarborough? Mr. Scarborough votes aye. Mr. Shattuck? Mr. Shattuck votes aye. Mr. LaTourette? Mr. LaTourette votes aye. Mr. Sanford? Aye. Mr. Sanford votes aye. Mr. Sununu? Aye. Mr. Sununu votes aye. Mr. Sessions? Aye. Mr. Sessions votes aye. Mr. Pappas? Aye. Mr. Pappas votes aye. Mr. Snowbarger? Mr. Snowbarger votes aye. Mr. Barr? Mr. Barr votes aye. Mr. Miller? Mr. Miller votes aye. Mr. Lewis? Mr. Lewis votes aye. Mr. Waxman? No. Mr. Waxman votes no. Mr. Lantos? No. Mr. Lantos votes no. Mr. Wise? Mr. Wise votes no. Mr. Owens? Mr. Owens votes no. Mr. Towns? Mr. Kanjorski? Mr. Kanjorski votes no. Mr. Condent? Mr. Sanders? Mr. Sanders votes no. Mrs. Maloney? Mrs. Maloney votes no. Mr. Barrett? Mr. Barrett votes no. 
Ms. Norton? No. Ms. Norton votes no. Mr. Fatah? No. Mr. Fatah votes no. Mr. Cummings? No. Mr. Cummings votes no. Mr. Kucinich? Mr. Kucinich votes no. Mr. Bogloyevich? No. Mr. Bogloyevich votes no. Mr. Davis of Illinois? No. Mr. Davis of Illinois votes no. Mr. Tierney? No. Mr. Tierney votes no. Mr. Turner? No. Mr. Turner votes no. Mr. Allen? No. Mr. Allen votes no. Mr. Ford? No. Mr. Ford votes no. Mr. Horn? Aye. Mr. Horn votes aye. Mr. Souter? Mr. Souter votes aye. Mr. Towns? Mr. Condent? Mr. Mr. Towns just walked in. You Mr. Might Towns? Mr. Towns votes no. The clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, there are 24 ayes and 19 nays. 24 hours and 19 nays. The immunity vote fails for lack of a two-thirds majority. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hastert's recognized. I move to adjourn. Uh, it's been moved that the committee do now adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed signify by saying no. We stand adjourned.